All right, I have a couple of elements in Hosea chapter number 14 I want to focus on, but I derived the title of my sermon from Psalm chapter number 85, verse number 6. I want you to flip over there. It's going to be in the left in your Bible. Psalm chapter number 85, verse number 6. There's a very famous Baptist hymn that's based upon this song. Same title of that song, or this verse that is. Well, they're both songs, actually. It's a song based upon a song. Look at Psalm chapter number 85, verse number 6. <clears throat> it says, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? The title of the sermon this morning is Revive Us Again. I'm going to be preaching about revival. I'm going to be preaching about revival in two different ways. I'm going to be preaching about personal revival, a person being revived. And I'm also going to be preaching about a church being revived. Now, first of all, what does it mean to be revived? Well, vibe, that comes from the word life, right? That comes from the word life. And then what does the re prefix mean? It means to be given life again. So when we talk about we want revival, we're saying we want everybody to come to life again. We had life in the past. I'm getting ready to get down on everybody. No, I'm just kidding. We had life in the past, but we want to get life again, right? So let me say this in the beginning. I don't think that everybody is just dead in here. But I will say this, that I can tell that there's a lot of excitement that has dissipated over the past six months. And you know what? That's to be expected. That, if we're all human beings. We're all you know, human by nature. And when something is new to you, there's automatically an excitement related to that in the very beginning, right? When you came into the church service this morning, are you going to tell me that you had as much pep in your step as you did the first service of Valley Baptist? I'm sure that you didn't. If you told me you did, I wouldn't believe you. I'm sure that you didn't. But you know what? I want everybody to have as much pep in their step tonight as they did the first service. I want to try to wake everybody back up again to the point of how you were and the stage that you were in your spiritual walk as far as the excitement and the zeal that you had and the passion that you had the very first service of Value Baptist Church. Because nothing's changed. The goals are all still the same. We still worship the same God. We still have all the same possibilities. Nothing has changed at all. You know, the, the only thing that should have changed is that you grew a little bit closer, a little bit further in your spiritual maturity. Now, I want you to go back to Hosea chapter number 14. And first, I want to explain, you know, uh, uh, the, the concept of revival a little bit further because there's so much confusion about what takes place with revival. And I'm going to give you the three-step process, and we're going to look at a couple of different verses. We're actually going to go back to Psalm chapter number 85 in a moment. Uh, but I'm going to give you the three-step process of revival. And Hosea chapter number 14 is a discussion of revival. When you look at the nation of Israel repeatedly in the Old Testament, their, their you know, spiritual walk is like this. They're going downhill, and then they're being revived again. They're getting into sin and iniquity, and then they're coming back to life spiritually. They stop serving God, and then they start serving God again, repeatedly. You'll see this over and over and over again, especially if you look at the book of Judges, because it covers so quickly 400 years during that period of time. So you can see them just going downhill and uphill, downhill and uphill, just repeatedly over that period of time. And all throughout the Old Testament, that's what's going on. All throughout the Old Testament, you see them dying and then coming, coming back to life again. There's so many Baptist churches that stand up almost every week sometimes. But they'll stand up at least a couple of times a year, and they'll even have their revival meeting, right? The whole purpose is to revive everyone, right? To bring everyone back to life. And they preach this in such a way to where they think that, that God is going to just come down, and he's just going to you know, get a hold of all of your appendages, and he's just going to force you to do all these great things for God. All these great things for him. It's like this Calvinistic type of thinking that everything 100% relies upon God. Now, this is going to burn their biscuits real bad, those people that have this type, the revivalists. But let me say this. It almost, almost hardly any of it at all relies upon God. Almost none of it. Because man has free will. So if there's going to be a revival, it's going to take place because man did something. That's right. You know what? But here's the thing. Obviously, when we do, let me, let me clarify a few things. When we're, when we're doing great things, we're only doing them because God has instructed us what to do in the first place and because God empowers us. Now, I'm going to talk about how revival does begin with God. Number one, it has to begin with God. We're going to look at that 
right here. And actually, let's look, go ahead and look at Hosea chapter number 14. Look at verse number 1. He says this, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Verse 2, take with you words and turn to the Lord. Now, the first point that I want to make and the first step of revival is that revival begins with God's word. We're going to come back to this in just a moment, but revival has to begin with God's word. Look at verse number one right there again. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. That is God's word calling out unto man to return unto him, to come back unto him. Revival has to come first from God's word. Notice verse, the beginning of verse two, he says, take with you words. So he's, he wants you to take with you words. And turn to the Lord, watch this, say unto him, so here are the words, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. The end of the verse, so will we render the calves of our lips. Now when he says the calves of it, render means to give, calves is talking about a sacrifice. It's just like in Hebrews chapter number 13, it talks about the fruit of our lips. It talks about giving a sacrifice, and then it says, explains it further and says the fruit of our lips. So the calves of our lips, it's talking about sacrificing with your lips. Oftentimes people will make vows even in the Old Testament. So it's talking about a sacrifice of your lips. That's what it means. They would sacrifice a calf. So the calves of our lips, or the, like it says in the New Testament, like I said, the fruit of our lips. So that's the words that he wants you to take with him is what? He wants you to confess your iniquity unto him. That's what it's talking about. And that is the second step to revival. We're going to go back through the steps of revival here in just a moment. But first of all, it begins with God's word. Revival begins with God's word. Second of all, you have to confess your sins to God. You have to go to God. God isn't going to use you if you have all of this inert iniquity just burdened down upon you that you've never made right with him. God will not you know, uh, give, put his, his spirit, his power upon you and allow you to do great things if you're just filled with iniquity that is unconfessed. God will not use you. There's examples in the Bible of this repeatedly. Look at verse number three. Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Now watch what he says. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them. So now you personally, I don't know, like I said, I want to focus this on a personal revival, because that's where it has to begin. And then everyone comes together personally as individuals, and then the church is revived. You can provoke others unto good works. You can provoke others to have great zeal in their Christian lives. But I don't know what's going on personally in your life. I don't know if it's similar unto the nation of Israel where you have backslided in your Christian life, where you're not reading your Bible as often as you should, where you're not doing the things. If, if, you know, let me explain it to you this way too. Backsliding isn't always the way that you picture it as well. You know, it could be, you can be right now at a lesser state in your spirituality than you were a year ago. And you may not even be into great sin, but you backslided. Backsliding just means going backwards. So if you're climbing up the Christian walk, right, you're climbing up the Christian hill, and you were at a greater part, you know, a higher portion, when I say greater, a greater, a greater part of that hill two years ago than you are today, you've backslided. It doesn't mean that you're in some grievous sin. Now, you may be in the great iniquity. I don't know. You may be into sin in your life. I don't know. I don't know everyone's personal life, what's going on in their mind, their life. And, but, and if you are, you need to confess that sin. You need to confess that grievous sin. But also on top of that, everyone has sins. Everyone has sins. You know what they need to do? They need to confess that sin. And even if today you say, well, I'm at the top of my walk today. That's not a good attitude to have, number one. But number two... Even if you are truly and in reality at the top of your game in your Christianity, the top of your spirituality that you've ever been at in your life, you still, you know what you need to do with this morning's sermon? This, hopefully this sermon motivates you to take a couple more steps up that hill. Amen. To not just be stagnant and complacent and content with where you are in your Christian life, 
but to keep marching on and to move forward. If, if you don't need necessarily to be revived and you haven't backslided or you are more dead than you were at the first service or you feel just as excited or more, more excited, well, then hopefully, you know, I can help push you up that hill a little further. God's Word can help push you up that hill a little bit further. So what we want to do is we just want to become a greater Christian. That's the attitude that we should always have. You should never become content in your Christian life. You should always be pressing forward to the perfect man. That's why we never should be comparing ourselves among ourselves because it's vain and it's pointless. Because we're because it does you know we're both number one. Obviously, it doesn't make sense because we we both started with different uh, at different platforms. But number two, I don't want to be as good as Russell. I don't want to be as, as good as Josh. My limit, I'm never going to reach my limit, so I'm just going to do as best as I possibly can and keep going. Keep going. It's not like, oh, I want to get to where that person is and then I'll be satisfied. No. Right. When I get to where they are, I'm going to go past that. Amen. And then I'm just going to keep going. And then I'm just going to keep going until hopefully I don't see anybody anymore. I can just keep pressing forward. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know why I say that is because there's no limits. That's my point. You should always, that's the point, you should all, even if you got to the top of your game and there's no one else there, that doesn't mean stop. That's my point. Amen. Even if you are the greatest Christian, you think Paul is like, well, I'm, you know, I'm better than all these people, therefore I can just stop. No, the point is not to compare yourselves among yourselves, and you just keep going forward. You just keep pushing forward. Good. Look at here in Hosea chapter number 14. I want you to look at verse number uh, look at verse number 5. We read 4. Look at verse number 5. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. So notice how God is the dew and then they're going to grow, he's saying. He's providing the nutrients, but then they're from that point forward going to grow. He said, I'll be the dew on Israel, and he shall grow as the lily. So the, the lily's receiving life. And it says they'll cast forth his roots, right? So there's life here as Lebanon. Verse 6. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. Look at verse 7. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. And then he says this. They shall revive as the corn and grow as as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. So there we see actually the word revive. And he says that they will revive, implying that they were living or they had life prior to this. But he says that they will revive, and he says, as the corn and grow as the vine. I want you to turn over to uh, Psalm chapter number 138. So we're going to see this very similar statement to what we saw a moment ago in Psalm chapter number 85. Psalm chapter number 138, verse number 7. Again, that's Psalm chapter number 138, verse number 7. I'm going to read you the last couple of verses there of Hosea chapter number 14. I want you to notice when they revive, what it starts saying happens. What's the, 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 uh, the result of them reviving? Verse 8, it says in, in Hosea 14, you don't have to turn there. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him and, and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. I want you to notice that there's fruit being spoken of. Now, now they're bearing forth fruit. It says this in verse 9. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and it says, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall there. And so we can see repentance in this particular person that's being spoken of now. We can see that they, number one, they heard God's word, they received God's word, they confessed, number two, the sins that they had, and then number three, what did they do? They returned unto the Lord, and then they started bearing forth fruit. They came back to the Lord, and they started bearing fruit. And as I said, our situation, I'm sure, is not exactly the same as Israel. I hope no one woke up worshiping idols this morning, and they're going to be confessing that sin and then turning back to the Lord today. I sure hope that that's not your situation, but you know what? All of us have sin Amen. that we need to repent of and that we need to confess to God. <laughs> so the first step of revival is hearing God's word. It has to come from God's word, number one. Number two, and obviously you have to receive God's word. Number two, you need to confess your sins. 
You need to confess your sins to God or God will not use you. God will not put his power upon you if you do not confess your sins. And then number three, what happens is now it's, a part, now it's on man's part. What does he have to do? He has to repent of the worshiping of the idols in this case. He has to repent of whatever it may be. Laziness, sinful living, whatever it may not be. Not reading his Bible, not going soul winning. He has to repent of those things. And then he has to turn back to God and start doing the things that he's supposed to do. Now, here's the thing. All these churches that preach about revival, 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 do you know what they do? They accomplish step one and step two. That's what they accomplish all the time. Do you know what the hardest step is? Step three. That's why they don't do step three. Step one, somebody stands up and preaches God's word. They hoot and they holler for an hour about revival, revival. We're going to turn back to God. And then they come up to the, to, the, to the faux altar, the fake altar, right? And people bend down and they pray. And you know what? In, in a lot of people's hearts, they might be sincere. I believe they are. I've been, a, I've been to revivals like that where it seems like people are very sincere. They're crying. They're confessing sins. But you know what happens? They go home and that's it. They think revival's over. No, no, that's just the beginning. For step one and step two, the purpose of that is to get you to step three. The whole reason you confess your sins is so that God can start using you and you can start doing work. Amen. Step three is the real revival that we want. Step three is really what we're looking for, and it's, getting, it's, it's where people are bearing fruit. It's where they're starting to do more work. And you say, well, I'm already working for God. Well, then do more. Amen. I don't care how much you're going soul winning. Go more. Amen. Go more. Don't, you know, if you're to the point where I just can't sacrifice time for my family, okay, it's understandable. But I doubt that that's where you're at today. Go, go soul winning more. You know what? I don't know how much you read your Bible. Read it more. Amen. I don't know how much you pray. Pray more. Amen. You know, I, you, would you really be as brazen to raise your hand this morning and say, you know what, I just don't have time to pray more, I don't have time to read my Bible more, and I don't have time to go soul winning more? Would anybody really be that bold to raise your hand and say, can't do those things? And this is not just for men. You know, a lot of times in revivals, the focus is just put, put upon the men, all, all, very often, but it's not. All the women, read your Bible more, pray more. You know, go soul winning more. If you're not going soul winning at all, start going soul winning. Amen. Put together a time where the ladies are going soul winning. You know, this is a revival is for the entire church. It's not just, hey, men, let's revive ourselves and then just leave the women in the, in the dust. <laughs> let's go do a lot of work and then just leave all the women behind. Of course, there are other obligations that, be, that are the priorities for the women. But that does not mean that you neglect soul winning, you neglect reading your Bible, you neglect prayer. That is not what that equals at all. You know, so revival is for an entire church. It starts on a personal level. And, and, and at that point, if each individual receives God's word, they confess their sins. And then step three, they actually start doing work. Each individual can. And there, maybe let's say there's a couple people that it just doesn't catch with. Well, you know what's going to happen is they're going to slowly be influenced and provoked over time, and then that will, that, that will catch with them over time. That's what would happen. Now, here in Psalm chapter number 138, I want you to look at verse number 7. I believe it's, yeah, verse number 7. We see that same statement again. I want to focus on step number 1 for just a moment, where it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath, the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Now, oftentimes what happens when these people stand up and they preach revival, God's going to revive us again. They always use these same passages. And I've been to revival tent meetings where people will stand up and they'll preach Psalm 138, Psalm 85. And they say, revive us again. And the entire sermon is about God doing the work. God sending his spirit. And like God's just going to send his spirit upon you and just force you. Just God's spirit enters into man and he's just, he's ready to do work. Against his own will, that is. That's not how it works. God will put his spirit upon you, but God does not impose his will upon you. God will put his spirit upon you and give you his power, but God's not going to force you. Now, I'm going to explain to you a confusion of step one that they do not get, that they do not understand. Because they quote these verses, God does the revival. And they stand up and they say that God is the one that has to do the revival. The reviving. 
God is the one that has to revive us. And, and what they do is they don't understand that the reviving is step one. God does not do the work. Man does the work. God does not come down and go soul winning. God does not force you to go soul winning. Man does those things. The reviving comes from God's word. So right here we see that statement again. Thou wilt revive me. I want you to go back to Psalm chapter number 85. Psalm chapter number 85. And I want to explain this concept to you and you'll see it again here. Number one, I pointed out to you in Hosea chapter number 14. Where God first called out to man to revive. Didn't he? He called out to man and told him that he needed to change his ways. He needed to return back to him and he needed to live again. And God, God in that sense revived him because God's word is what brings forth life, isn't it? When you're saved, what happens? God's word gives you life. When Jesus breathed the breath of life into, uh, well, he did that in Adam's nostrils too. But when he breathed the Holy Spirit upon the men, he breathed upon them, the disciples, what happened? He spoke. It was his word. Now the Bible tells you, it, it's talking about in John 1, that all things were made by him, talking about the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. We look at, and, and that means Adam was also given life by God's word. And what happens? He breathes the breath of life into Adam's nostrils, and man became living soul. So, the reviving begins with God's word. Always. I'm not going to stand up here and just give you an inspirational speech. And because of my personal inspiration, you're just going to be compelled to go out and do things. Now, even in that sense, what does it mean to, what, is, what does inspiration mean? It means to breathe into something, doesn't it? Inspi to, to inspire, if you break the word down, in means inside of, right? Inspire comes from spiration like spirit. It means breathe. Like expire means they, to breathe out. Respire means to breathe again. The spire right there comes from, that root word comes from spirit like life. So even the inspiration, it's, it's someone you know, uh, motivating you or in a, in a figurative sense giving you life to go do something. If you're going to do something spiritually, though, it's not just going to be from a motivational speaker. It's not going to come from just somebody who stands up and is very eloquent or somebody who stands up and they just, they use, you know, they finally explained it to me in, in, in their words and then I finally understood it. The inspiration is going to come from God's word. Now, these revivalists, they have that right, that they at least stand up behind the pulpit and they preach God's word to an extent. Most of them, they'll stand up and they, they know that revival is going to begin from where? From God's word. That'd be a pretty sorry revival that I wouldn't want to be a part of if it began from somewhere other than God's word. So God revives us, but it, it comes from the revival of him, of, of the revival that he gives us comes from his word. Now I want you to notice here in verse number eight, watch what it says in verse number six again. Psalm 85 verse number six, it says, wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Watch verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. So he's asking for revival, but you know what comes first? God speaks unto man. God will speak to man, and that is where the reviving comes from. That is where the inspiration comes from. That is where the compelling comes from. It comes from God's word. So he says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, and let them not turn again to folly. So the revival does come from God, but the work does not come from God. The revival comes from God because God quickens us by his spirit. You know, all over throughout Psalm 119, what does David say? Quicken me with thy spirit. So where is the reviving coming from? From God's spirit. It's coming from God's word. The words that I speak into you, they are spirit and they are life. If we're going to have a real revival, it's going to come from God's word. There's going to be something in the Bible or something that I preach from the Bible, not my own words, that compels you to do more work. That's what it's going to be. You're going to hear God's word and it's going to push you to do more for God. I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter number 14. Nehemiah chapter number 14. <clears throat> so real revival begins... With God's word. Then the very next step, once you hear God's word, you have to receive it. God does not force you to receive it. So revival begins with God's word and you have to receive God's word. After that, 
You need to confess your sins to God so that you're a vessel that God can use, so that you're someone that God is willing to use. You need to confess whatever sins that you have, whatever sins that they may be, whether they're grievous or whether they're small. You need to confess those sins to God. And then number three, and that's what we're going to look at right now, the most important part, the most avoided part, the one that actually completes it and makes it a revival in the first place is doing work, is actually getting to work and doing the work. I want you to look at, at uh, Nehemiah chapter number four. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter number four. Nehemiah chapter number four, look at verse number one. But it came to pass that when Sembalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Now this right here in context is a time of revival for Israel. They were in captivity in, in Babylon, and now Nehemiah came back. And we know Ezra and Nehemiah, both those books were written about the same period of time. They're written, uh, you know, speaking about the same period of time. And Ezra was the priest. He went back to build the temple. And Nehemiah came back, and he's a prophet of God, to build the wall. So this is a time of revival for them where they're coming back and they're rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall. And it says that people mocked them. They mocked the Jews. Look at verse 2. And he spake... Before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Now watch this. It's interesting that this word is used right here. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now notice he says, will they revive or bring back to life all the stones? He's mocking them and saying that this is a job that cannot be done. He's mocking them and saying that they're too feeble, number one. They're too feeble means weak. He's saying, you're too weak to get this job done, number one. And then they're saying, number two, where are you going to get the material? It's impossible. What are you going to go revive the stones that are broken down? You're going to take those stones that were all broken down and destroyed, and then you're going to use those stones... And start rebuilding the wall with those stones. One more time, look at that statement. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Look at verse 3. Now, I want to keep reading. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So notice how these people are just standing by. While they're in the middle of working, they're receiving all this persecution. They have a job to be done. They're building a wall, and then people are just mocking them and making fun of them and saying, you're too weak. You're not going to be able to do the job. You don't even have the materials to do the job. And then they're like, look at what they're building. Even while they're building it, they're looking at it. They're like, look at what they're building. Look at that. Even if a fox went up there, it would knock that whole thing down. Can't we relate to this a lot? Yeah. Is that, I'm, I'm assuming that just about every person here was thinking, that sounds like our church right now. <laughs> was everybody thinking that? When I read this, it's the first thing that I thought. Because how many churches right now are in opposition to us? How many people out there, thousands really, when you really start counting people, that just mock Valiant Baptist Church and mock all the people that attend our church and make fun of them? What are they saying? They're going to be nothing. They're not going to get anything done. You know, and then the full extent, they're like, they're not even saved, right? <laughs> but they just stand there and they just mock them. They make fun of the Jews here. Look at what it says in verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of iniquity. I'm not going to lie, I wish that would happen to a lot of these people. Look at verse 5. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builder. Now I want to focus on the next verse. <clears throat> so built we the wall. Notice what he said. So, and after he talks about the persecution, after he talks about all these people that are trying to oppose them, and while they're building, they're mocking them, making fun of them. The next verse he just says, so built we the wall. In the midst of the persecution. In the midst of being mocked and made fun of. And you know what Valley Baptist Church is going to say? So built 
we the wall. Amen. Amen. We're going to build Amen. the wall no matter what. Amen. It doesn't matter how many. I don't care if every church. and I don't care if every single Baptist church turns against us. That's right. Every. I don't care if every single church in the United States would turn against us. Right. It's obviously hypothetical. We are going to build that wall no matter what. That's right. We're going, to, we're going to do the work of God no matter what. They can all come out here. They wouldn't fit. But you can put thousands of people out here every morning. And I'm still coming into this church. And I'm still preaching. And I'm, we're still going to go soul winning. And this church is still going to keep operating. Amen. And we're going to build the wall no matter what. And you know what you can do? You can shy away when there's persecution. Or you can thrive on the persecution. Right. You, can, you, know, you, you shouldn't require drama to keep you going. But you, you know, it sure is a lot of times gas in my tank and will push me further and to get more things done. It really is. I can't wait till 20 years goes by and we have this massive wall that we can turn around and look at. We have this, this big church that's just getting tons of work done. So many more people that we have coming in and going soul winning. So many more people coming in and they're just hungry to hear the word of God on Sunday night, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. People that have come in, 20 years have went by, and then their whole lives have been transformed. And those same people have went out and they started building the wall too. They went out and they got people saved and then they brought people in to sit down. Amen. They, and you know what? You never know how long time goes by. Maybe that person, maybe three generations went on spiritually. And they have three generations of, of, of someone that they went out and they got saved. We're going to build the wall no matter what. Amen. I want you to look at what it says in verse 6 as well. There's a statement at the very end I want to focus on now. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For, watch this, for the people had a mind to work. I love that verse. I love that statement. Amen. For the people had a mind to work. You know what it means? They were resolved. They had their mind made up. It did not matter how much persecution. It didn't matter how much mockery. It didn't matter what said Balak, what any of these, these, these idiots said, Tobiah the Ammonite. It didn't matter what they said. They had a mind to work. And that's how you should be. Amen. It shouldn't matter what garbage people put out there. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a garbage can with all of us in it. I hadn't seen that until just recently, right? Yeah, I don't care what, what means you make Sam Ballot. It doesn't matter to me, Tobiah. Right. You keep on running your mouth. Yeah. Because we're going to build the wall anyway. It's happening no matter what. That's right. You can, and that, that was the hope. Was, was to try to just run everybody away, just to scare everybody. The wall is being built. And you know what? You know what you're going to do? Keep on persecuting the church, and that wall is going to go up even faster is what's going to happen. Right. Because you're not pushing me down. You're giving me fuel to just work harder. Right. I've right. been revived over the past like week and a half, two weeks again. Yeah. That's why one of the reasons. I've been wanting to preach this. And then and I've been thinking about it, kind of putting an idea together about, about this. Because, of course, like I said... You know, it's not that our church has become dead, but it's just the newness has kind of weared off. So I wanted to preach something again to kind of kick everybody in the pants one more time. And let's, let's get rejuvenated again. Let's revive again. Let's get back and let's look at those goals and not forget about the goals of what we want to do here at Valiant Baptist Church. And then just after the past week, two weeks, I just kind of was, was, was a revived again. Where I just want to do more work again. I wanted the goals that I had when I started the church, I want to make them bigger. Amen. I want to get there as fast as I possibly can. And when you hear the persecution when people are mocking you, you know what you can do? You can put your tools down and you can go home. Or do you know what else you can do? You know what you should do? You should work harder. Hey, you should work faster. You should have a mind to work. It means, you know, you're not going to bother me. Yeah. That's what it's saying. So build me the wall. And he says, Why? Because the people had a mind to work. Amen. Say, we built the wall anyways, and we got it done because we already had our mind made up. We already knew what we were going to do. Anything, you know, all of this, all of the exterior, all, all the persecution, everything that comes from out there, it's not changing anything. It's, we're not backing down. We're just marching faster now. We're marching harder. I'm making the goals bigger. I want to get there even faster I want to do even bigger things. Amen. You know, it should compel you. Can you imagine that? While they're just up on the wall and then San Ballad and Tobiah the Ammonite are just like standing there mocking them from the ground. Just mocking them. And then and let's say they're laying mortar. I don't know if you know how to lay mortar or anything like that. 
But they're scooping out the mortar and they're just laying it down, it's packing a brick on it, you know, shaping it and everything, right? Getting off all the edges and they start mocking them. They're making fun of them. And it's just like, it's just, they start working faster. We're going to get this down even faster now. Give me another brick. Give me another brick. Let's lay another brick down. Let's, let's go soul winning even more. Let's go do more. I'm going to read my Bible even more now. Amen. I'm going to start reading my Bible more. I'm going to, I'm going to amp up my, my Bible memorization. I'm going to give back my Bible memorization that I've kind of let fall by the wayside. I'm going to start making sure that I'm praying more, and I'm going to be reading my Bible even more. Amen. I'm going to be doing more. The persecution should not be pushing you backwards. It should be pushing you forwards. Right. It shouldn't be causing you to, you know, to just want to quit. It should be making you want and desire to get that wall built faster. Amen. To do more. Amen. To, you know, to work harder. You know what you need to have? You need to have a mind to work. What's the point of a revival? The, the, the goal is to make things different at the end. The goal is to change. So it begins with God's word. Yeah, of course, God begins the revival because God is the one that speaks the words that tells you to revive in the first place. He's the one that gives life. And how does he always give life? By his word. So yes, God revives us. Revive us again. But you know what? You have to receive God's word. You have to hear it. And you know what you have to do? You need to confess any faults that you have to make yourself a vessel to be used. But step three is the step that everyone's missing. You need to get to work. Amen. You need to start working. And you know what? You know, it's sad because I believe that a lot of those people that go to those revivals, when they get excited for a couple of hours, when they get excited hearing the preaching, a lot of them probably think at that time, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Right? You hear people say that to you all the time. I'm going to change this. I'm going to change that. They'll hear a sermon that revives them. Right? But not for very long. Why? Because they don't do any work. And God's not going to just let his spirit rest upon you. When you're doing nothing for him. He's not going to just continually send the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about God putting the power on you of the Holy Spirit. God's not going to just, you know, if you're not, if you're not in the condition or the state to be used, God's not going to, God's not going to just put his spirit upon you just and, 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 and he's not going to force you to do things. We need to understand. That the third step, God always wants to use man, but it's always up to man. Always, every time. God has a job to be done, people can back out and God will get somebody else. Right? You can step up to the plate or you can back up and let somebody else do the job. Right? When God has things that he wants to get done... God, it's not like God's sitting up in heaven. It's, it, 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 I always think this, this concept. It's not like God is like sitting up in heaven. And then there's certain times when he just doesn't want revivals. I don't think it's a good time. Next year. We'll have a revival next year. Because that's what you would have to believe, right? We're just waiting for God to revive us. He doesn't want you to, to do work for him? No, you're lazy. That's right. That's why nothing's getting done you know, he doesn't want you, you know, when God, God revives us, you know, God revives me and there's a revival, I'm going to start reading my Bible. It's like, what in the world? God doesn't want you reading your Bible today. No, that's not how it works. The revival starts with God's word. They, 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 they act like it's going to be like the day of Pentecost every other year. <laughs> Seriously. And God, like the door's going to bust open and wind comes in. You know? And then all of a sudden, Brother Russell's speaking Hebrew or something. They are Pentecostal. No, you know, that's not going to happen. It's not like revival is not like this, like, overly spiritual, you know, uh, divine intervention where God just, like, causes everyone to do all these crazy things. No. You're not apostles. God's, God is not right now, you know, I'm not going to get into that particular, you know, part of you know, cessationism is a fact. There are things that God does not do. Cessationism is the teaching that there are things that, that a lot of the miracles and things like that are not done anymore. God does not, God does not, you know, there may be exclusive, I don't know, there may be like exclusive times when God sends the Spirit upon somebody and enables them to speak, you know, in a language, speak in another tongue. I don't know. God can do that is why I say that. I know he can do that at any time. He can do it just as much today as he could then. There may be like 
uh, just specific times when God has done that, past the point of when the miracles or signs stopped with Paul. But it's not, you know, God's not doing that at this time. You know, you know what it's up to? It's up to you. That's right. And if you want to have a revival, if you want Value Baptist Church to grow, if you want there to be a big wall, and this church is the wall. Amen. That's what it is. And if you want there to be a big wall, then you need to pick up a tool and pick up a brick. Amen. That's what you need to do. You need to start reading your Bible more. You need to start growing spiritually so you're that much stronger when you go door to door. And, and you're that much, and you have answers to people when they ask a question, and then they're like, that's a church I want to go to. After they get saved, they start asking you questions, and God's word just makes perfect sense to them for the very first time, and they're like, that's a church I want to go to. That's where you need to be in your Christian world. <laughs> you need to start reading your Bible more. You need to start praying more. You need it from this sermon on, you need to amp it up. Amen. See, there's a real challenge going forward that everyone, men, women, everyone in our church, Start doing more. These last two months of this year, we need to push you know, more than we have since the, the, since the church began. I'm gonna, I am going to do more in these last two months of this year, November and December, than I've ever done in two months in my Christian life. I'm pushing myself way further than I ever have. I'm doing way more these last two months of this year. And I'll carry that on as, as much as I can. You know, confessing a fault to you, you know, over the past year and a half, my Bible knowledge has dissipated a little bit. Just everything that's going on, I know it's just like small facts that I just don't remember all the time. I'm like, how in the world do I not know that? How do I not remember that? Why is that not clear in my mind? And it could just be because of everything that was going on. I'm moving constantly. I got so many other things in my mind. I'm doing a lot of work here, working at my mom and dad's house, and I'm fixed up there. You know, but I'm, I'm getting, I'm pushing myself back, and I'm going to be even stronger than I was at my highest point. Amen. I, you know, and I'm not comparing myself with you. I'm, talking, I'm comparing myself with myself. Amen. That's what you need to do. Amen. You need to make sure in 2019, January 1st, that you are further in your Christian walk than you've ever been in your life. Amen. This is, I'm not just speaking to men. I'm talking to women too. But have more Bible memorized. Have, you know, memorize new chapters. You know, read the Bible more. Get stronger in your Bible knowledge. Go, you know, pray more, go soul anymore, do more work, everything. Amen. Amen. Do more just work around the church, whatever's needed. Spiritual things. Let's build this stinking wall. Amen. I want to get it built as fast as possible. Right. And you know what? At the end of it, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to laugh at Tobiah and Sam Valley. Amen. Amen. I'm going to laugh at them. I'm going to mock them. And that's biblical, by the way. Right, right. I'm gonna mock them. They they want to stand there and mock the whole time. Half of people would half of the people would 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 uh, they would cringe if they heard someone praying like an imprecatory prayer. And what is what does Nehemiah and all the people do here? Sambalat and Ammonite and and uh, Tobiah the Ammonite they're mocking them. And obviously these people aren't saved. You know Sambalat and and Tobiah. But they're mocking the Israelites and they go and they pray to God like curse these people. Don't blot out their sin, Lord. That's pretty harsh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and most people would be like, oh my gosh, what did he just say about them? Like if I stood up there and said, I hope that guy goes to hell, whoever it is, some like wicked, evil, like pedophile or something, a lot of Christians would be like, what in the world? Yeah, yeah kind of like date, all the imprecatory prayers that David writes right. in the book of right. Psalms. Right, exactly. Kind of like, like I could go, you, there are so many examples of people saying, I hope they, like, I hope that person dies. I hope you don't blot out their sins. Mm -hmm. And here's one, another one of them right here. Right. It happens all the time. Right. I mean, look at some of the things like Elijah. Mm -hmm. He like, they have the duel, the, the, the face off, calls down fire. He wins the battle and then he goes and kills, you know, all these prophets. Right. You know, I'm not telling you to take up a sword. We're in the New Testament. <laughs> but what I am saying is the God of the Bible is much different than a lot of people think. That's right. 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 Yep. That's what I'm saying. Amen. Everything right here is applicable today. Amen. And if there was some, like, if there were a bunch of, like, like sodomite homos outside just, like, protesting our church saying we hate you, I would pray for all those people to die and burn. Amen. Amen. I would. Right. I would pray like 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 reprobate evil people like these people who are pagans and they didn't want that wall being built because they hated the God of the Bible. I would pray for them to die and go to hell. Right? Amen. I, would, right. I would I would pray that God would curse those people. Amen. 
You know, because if you don't apply it there, where do you apply it? Right. I mean, goodness sakes. Yeah. Right? You know, but here's the thing. We need, to get, we need to stay focused on the wall. That's what it's saying. That's another point that, that, that's coming out of it that says they had a mind to work. You can thrive off the persecution, but here's another point. You can't allow the persecution to sidetrack you. Because you, can't, you have to have a mind to work. Not just a mind to just fight these idiots, right? Not just a mind to just always defend myself. To always make sure that I, that I straighten out you know, the lies that people tell about me. Right? You have to have a mind to work. You know, my, my job is not to make sure that I have you know, a, a great reputation at the end of my life. Yeah. I can give a crap about what people think about me. Hey, I'm dead serious. Good. I don't care what the majority of people think about me. I don't, I'm, I, I don't know if everyone understands this truly, but the new IFB's opinion of me means crap. I'm dead serious. I don't care what they think at all, period. Man. The new videos that they come out with, don't, I'm telling you, they don't bother me at all. Like, not even a tiny, not even a smidgen. Not even, you know, any minute amount. I was trying to think of the smallest amount, and then I thought, well, am I going to go with fluid ounces? No, I'm just kidding. I really was, actually. <laughs> not even the smallest amount of anything. Not a speck. It doesn't bother me at all. You know, it, it, you should never allow things like that to bother you because... You need to have a mind to work. Amen. Because I don't care what they say. My, I'm not going to spend my time defending them. I'm going to spend my time building a wall. I'm going to spend my time working. I'm going to spend my time doing something for God. I don't want to die and have a good reputation and I have two bricks laid. Right. You take my yeah. reputation and you drag it through the mud. I don't give a crap what you think about me. I'm building this wall here. Good. You Good. just, you just, you go, you say whatever you want to say. You run your mouth, make as many videos as you want, talk about our church all you want. But you know what? Put 40, 50 videos out this week, but that wall is gonna have a couple more new bricks laid, buddy. Amen. That wall is gonna have more bricks laid this week. We're gonna be putting down mortar. We're gonna be laying bricks. We're gonna be doing more work this week than we did last week. Amen. You know what? Just keep persecuting the church because you know what? You're just, you're just helping me thrive. Right. You're pushing me and, 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 and wanting me to do more. Amen. Number one, it kind of made me do just like, you know, just, it just made me for some reason observe myself. And I was like, you know what? I need to get even stronger. Because I, I, I can tell that I'm just, I'm, I know, I, I'm weaker than I was at certain points. So I'm going to make sure that I get stronger. You know what? By the end of the year, I'm going to be stronger than I ever have. I have a goal. I have a, and, and you know what? You need to have a challenge too. Use the same challenge that in 2019, January 1st, Every Christian in here, think about how much better that would be spiritually for our church if every single person sitting in a chair today is at the top of their game on January 1st, 2019. How much more effective for God could this church be if every Christian... A lot of times you just have personal revivals going on. It's not congregational revivals. You know, you'll just have two or three people that are just really on fire for God. They have a new zeal. They have new life given to them. And, you, and, and it, like I said, it comes from God's Word. You'll read the Bible and you'll find a couple things in there. Has anybody done that? And then it just revives you. It makes you more excited about God's Word. You know, it makes you want to do more for God. It makes you want to start souling more. A lot of times it's personal revivals. But how much more effective, how much greater could it, could it be if a whole church is all having a personal revival like that? Everyone independently has just been revived. Everyone's just at the top of their game spiritually. They're reading their Bible more than they ever have. They're praying more than they ever have. They're going souling more than they ever have. They're more zealous for God. They're thinking about the Bible, talking about the Bible. They have goals and plans. They're going out and doing follow-up. They're doing all these things that they've never done before every single member in the church. You know what's going to happen? The wall's going to be built that much faster. Amen. The wall's going to be that much bigger than it would have been. Do you know what you need to do personally? You need to decide today. You need to decide today that you're actually going to do step three. Right? You can hear the sermon today, be excited, and wake up tomorrow morning, you know, and just be the lazy Monday morning like usual. Right? Be the same person that you were last Monday. You know, you know I'm young, but I'm not getting any younger. You know what? I don't want ten years to go by. And to be the same Christian that I was today. 
I want to have goals where I'm continually pushing myself forward and, and, and becoming a greater Christian, doing greater things, than, even greater things than what I expected to do. You need to have a personal revival, and you know what? You need to care about everybody else in the church. You need to be trying to provoke all the other people in the church to do more. Ask everybody how much you've read your Bible lately. Start, you know, asking people. I used to be in a habit of that all the time. At first thing, right when I see you. Because I was like, you know, and like I said, you know, my Bible, not, you know, my daily Bible reading isn't lacking as much, but I can just tell, like, my, you know, my mind is scattered while I'm reading. You know, I'm not, like, focusing all the time. But when I was at, you know, at the point where you guys are thinking, like, I was like, I was reading more than my daily Bible reading all the time. I had Bible memorization going all the time. I was thinking about the Bible constantly. All I want to do is talk about the Bible, right? I'm going to get back to that and more, personally. But I can't force you to do it. You, you know, you are the one that has to do it. And be ready when I start saying, what did you find in the Bible lately, buddy? Give me a nugget that you noticed in the Bible recently. Right? You know, I, we shouldn't be content. Right. That's what I want to end on. Yeah. Don't, I don't care where you're at in your Christian life. You say, I'm at the top of my game. I don't care. You think God just wants you to stay there? No. You need to keep pushing forward. You need to keep doing more. Let's build this wall. Amen. Let's build this church. Amen. Let's get serious about building this church. Let's get people into this church. Amen. Let's get people a part of this. And let's let them know what great thing we're going to do for God here. Mm -hmm. Share your excitement with the people you're talking at at the door. I'll find myself doing that sometimes, not even just uh, purposely, just so that I can let them know. Not, not even for that reason, but just because I'm excited sometimes. Like, you know, we're, I'll just start, like, talking about it just because it's on my mind. But we're, we're working real hard getting people in church right now. We really want to, you know, build the church up so that we can just change Jacksonville. And I'll start thinking to myself, just like, I didn't say that for your benefit. It's just because it's on my mind. You know what I mean? Get like that. T share, the, share these goals with other people so that they know something that they can be a part of here. Let's get real serious. I don't want to just become this church like all these other Baptist churches. They're all the same. You know how many Baptist churches there are in Jacksonville? And they all number around 70, 80 people, and they're all about 70, 80 years old. And, no, and no, no new members have been added. No one's doing nothing. No one's going soul winning. That's the value of Baptist church is not going to be in that category. Amen. We are not going to be in that category. We are not playing church. Amen. We are building a wall. We are doing work. Amen. And that's what we are going to be doing. And, and you know what? I want this to be a revival to you. I want this to revive you. Let's get back to the very first service. Let's do more right now than you've ever done in your life. When you have spare time, read your Bible. Memorize the Bible. Set goals. Just try to do more than you've ever done for God. Ever. This month, next month, try to do more than you've ever done. You know what? If you got to sleep less, sleep less. Amen. That's why that's been on my mind more, too. You know, my wife and I were here till 10.30 last night. We were here till. What time? The night before? Friday night? What time did you leave? We left right after you, 11.30, and I got up in the morning. And what time? You picked me up? Oh, I got up at 4.30. Yeah, what time did I wake up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got up at 4.30 the next day. Because you, know, you have things you got to do. Amen. You know what? Stop being lazy. Amen. And start working. Stop sleeping so much and read your Bible. Start memorizing the Bible. Man. Let's follow the examples of people in the Bible. I want to be like the people in the Bible. I want to really be like them. I want to be like Paul. Right. You know, I want to be, I want to have, you know, think about the zeal that Paul had to have. To preach all night, like I talked about, the entire night. Then he heals somebody, brings them back to life through the power of God. They sit down, they eat, and then he bids them farewell and goes to the next place. You know what he's thinking about? I have goals of where I'm going right now. I'm going to go to that church and I'm going to preach. I'm going to go to that city and I'm going to preach to every single person in that city and I'm going to start a church there. He had a goal when he left. I'm positive of that. I'm 100% positive of that. He was on a mission the whole time. Go preach the world to everybody. Other people weren't getting it done. All the disciples, they wanted to hang out in Jerusalem and do their thing. So Paul went and preached the gospel to the entire world. The entire world. Virtually. You know why? Because he had a goal. And he just kept pushing himself further. He just kept pushing himself further. That's what you need to do. Amen. Do more at the end of this year than you've ever done for God. Ever. Do more 
in the next two months than you've ever done accumulated in any in any two months. Let's say that that you've ever done. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that your word can revive, that it can bring life into us, dear God. It can inspire us and motivate us even in that sense to, to do more for you spiritually. Just please put your spirit upon our church. Put your spirit upon every member here and help us to do more than we've ever done for you. Just help us to have a mind to work. Help us not to think about the persecution, dear God, and, and, and always you know, trying to clear our name and clear lies about us. Just help us just to have a mind to work, Lord. Help us. That's what we're minded with. Reminded on working. That's what's important to us. Be with us and bless us. Bless the rest of the day. Bless the food that we're about to eat for lunch. We love you. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.